Uh, in the morning, we have a dialogue after the first three presentations. After the presentation that we will have now, we will open for a dialogue with the four speakers on, on the subject matter. Um, I am very happy to introduce uh, Carlos Montalvo. Uh, he works as a senior scientist and innovation policy at TNO. He has extensive practice as engineering project and research and development management and in multidisciplinary and international policy research. Please, Carlos, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, thank you for those coming back and we have uh, new faces, at, uh, so we have a, a bigger audience now. Um, well, this, um, this morning we, we, had a, we had three presentations that uh, gave us some kind of background on the potential of uh, new technologies to transform and to contribute in a positive, uh, perhaps in sometimes not so positive way to the uh, achievement of the sustainable development goals. Um, I think if, if I need to give a message uh, before I get you bored and you, uh, you go with it, I think uh, the main message is that indeed there is um, a fantastic opportunity that are already, uh, let's say, crystallizing in, in cleaner processes, cleaner products uh, that are more sustainable. The digitalization, I mean, the, uh, uh, that is, is one of the emerging technologies that we saw, uh, let's say, the one of the two or three principles that we saw um, in the foresight uh, study presented earlier this morning is that the, the effect of digitalization across, uh, across different sectors and across the economy uh, and across society is really pervasive. Everybody, I mean, we, we saw some of the, let's say, effects uh, and that artificial intelligence is showing us in, in art, but also in how, how the processing of images is, <laughs> is done. And it's, it's, it's just really a magical experience that can be probably compared to the same we have when we use Google, or we, we search for information, or we ask for a taxi, or we order a product uh, through these digital platforms that are so pervasive now. Uh, the thing is, uh, something uh, that we see uh, in the consumer side uh, of, uh, of what is the internet now, it is something similar is happening also a revolution in what is going now in, in industry and in production, uh, production technologies and production processes. And if you see, I mean, th there are new areas of, uh, of application uh, that go into, let's say, advanced materials and processes, but also Making, making processes more efficient in terms of, of uh, let's say, materials, but also in, in, in energy. And above all, the connectivity be, uh, within companies with machinery, but also across, um, across companies and suppliers that can monitor directly the machinery that is being used in one factory floor. Uh, but what I wanted to show first is that uh, this promise uh, that, that we have seen uh, already in the past that I argued that was possible to, to have, uh, let's say, uh, cleaner uh, technologies um, is already happening. And um, I must admit that for many years I was very, very skeptical. Uh, for many years I was editor of uh, a journal that looked into these types of technologies. Uh, we saw more of the same coming with not really breakthroughs. But now, with, with the advance of new materials, uh, as, as Philippe uh, mentioned, that the convergence of different technologies is actually allowing for some of these gains to be materialized. Um, and I wanted just to show one, one example uh, in addition to what was mentioned this, this uh, uh, morning. Uh, there is one um, uh, that is, is very palpable uh, where, the, let's say, the technology producers, they were not aware of the benefits that they were bringing, uh, to the, to, let's say, to the um, manufacturing of uh, microelectronics. Uh, and this, this basically, they combine uh, the technology uh, that is used for uh, the printing, the, the fast printing press, that rolling, like rolling paper, yeah, and newspapers, uh, with uh, serigraphy and uh, new materials and, and polymers, where they have a, a thin film uh, that is 
uh, not only conductive, but also biodegra biodegradable. And so they, they were, they are doing now these kinds of uh, components for, uh, for let's say RFI, antennas, or any other uh, print electronics. That, are, that can be embedded within labels or within paper or, or part of a screen like you see, flexible, uh, flexible uh, displays now. Uh, but when they were uh, presenting this type of technology, they were not emphasizing or they were not aware completely of the kinds of effects that they could have along the supply chain. And basically what they substitute completely with, with uh, let's say, with a process that almost has no residuals, yeah, and the residuals that exist there is just metal. So it's completely recyclable. They substitute all the etching processing you see. And they substitute the production of PCBs. But they were not aware and they were not selling their technology with this characteristic of being environmentally friendly. And this is an example of things that are now <coughs> available. They are not widely diffused, but are happening. And of course, this enables uh, to produce cheaper electronics, but also recyclable electronics. Um, and this, when I say electronics, this led me to link it to what is going on in the production process, because it's not only that, um, let's say, um, the multi-sided the say platforms that we see like uh, Google, eBay, um, Alibaba, uh, that connect suppliers with consumers. Now it is happening now uh, at the level of industry as well, where uh, industries are connecting faster, in, uh, but are not only uh, in the, uh, let's say, in the trade of, of inputs and uh, intermediary products, business to business, but also connecting, in some cases, down to the floor shop and connecting direct, uh, let's say, machinery directly to the, to the suppliers on specialized engineering uh, capacities. So that what we see is, is, is that now um, there are, a crea let's say, the kinds of technology that we, uh, we see, um, let's say, widely diffuse uh, at the consumer level and industry also is pervading the way how production will be organized in a way that seemed not clear how this would pan out. But now we are seeing new, uh, some kind of patterns of how uh, what we call now multi-sided platforms and production. They would tend, I think, tend, would tend to replicate the form and how the big platforms that we know like Google, Facebook, uh, Uber operate also, so that we run the risk of some kind of, let's say, the same kind of concentration that we see uh, at the consumer level. And I want to, I want to just uh, point out that, that, that arrow that is there is basically the internet of things, yeah, which uh, it, it doesn't yet exist, but exists up to a partial form, in a partial form, is where industry is really getting together to create sort of kind of uh, industrial data spaces where they say data can be traded, stored, but also remain uh, uh, proprietary within the company. And somebody has the keys and somebody has the logs. And that's very well preserved and controlled, which is not the case for the consumer side where there is a complete asymmetry of our data. We don't know where it goes. But um, this type of, uh, let's say, multi-sided um, uh, of um, type of uh, um, industry now is, is some kind of a response of the previous, um, uh, some kind of, um, we could say, uh, exhaustion of the uh, uh, way how uh, uh, industry was uh, or is still organized, where a lot of the subcontracting is, uh, was being offshore to other countries or to other regions or to other companies and not being int uh, integrated uh, vertically, where was, uh, let's say, where the competition was just primarily in, in cost, yeah, and less in quality, and now we see that is more is becoming more uh, strong again in quality and in uh, in post service sale, which is enabled by the monitoring uh, to the, let's say, um, in many cases to the internet. Um, 
but what we see now is is that this uh, we, we're talking about this morning about um, the, the, the big data and data flows, and this is uh, let's say the, at least in the forerunners and in industry this is uh, enabled by uh, a great deal of digitalization uh, and the gathering of data uh, from the process uh, floor and share with with suppliers and and, and gather from client I mean from from uh, yeah from from customers no. Um, sorry, I want to just go down. Um, what happens now, um, uh, how data flow uh, is, is intended to flow, we have at, at the bottom line, this is, this, this is uh, where I think uh, where the, um, there are a couple of streams of different uh, trends um, converging. Uh, on one side, we have uh, the, the from the level of, of production, yeah, where we have there uh, a lot of machinery that is generating data then this is this is a recorder uh, and a store somewhere else in the cloud enabled by by uh, let's say high performance uh, uh, computing but also but uh, large reservoirs of of, uh, uh, of uh, let's say <coughs> a storing capacity and then this this goes up to another layer where there is the data is is uh, let's say curated but also used to monitor and make decision and at the super supervisory level but once more, I mean, that data is field created then to be, uh, to enable the, let's say, the control and production, um, the control of production and furthermore is, uh, let's say, concentrated for decision making and the strategic, uh, let's say, rooms of the, of the, of the companies and enterprise that's with planning. And this, uh, this is how the data flows up to, up to the top and is somehow the same way uh, how uh, labor and the organization of work operates uh, in a similar form. Because you have a massive number of staff at the bottom and it goes into, let's say, management process up to the top where the decision making is done at the same level uh, of the top of the pyramid. What we see now is that with, uh, with the model of the multi-layer, multi-layer, um, um, uh, the so, sorry, multi-sided um, um, peer-to-peer uh, um, digital platforms is that the possibility of uh, outsourcing um, the partial, uh, let's say, discrete parts of the production process even further uh, enable companies uh, to run large, uh, let's say, digital platforms with no owning assets. That basically, for example, um, Amazon can wage an enormous supply chain with not, with not only the factories but connecting to the clients. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in the same way, um, um, this um, Volcom, for example, does the same, uh, but other um, uh, like uh, TripAdvisor connects uh, hotels uh, in the same way. And the same logic is likely to happen uh, and is, is starting to happen um, and, um, and manufacturing in a way that is in, in some places called the, called the Air, uh, Airbnb manufacturing, which basically is uh, use of contract, the kinds of activities, uh, uh, manufacturing activities that you need in, in, in remote places where you can monitor <coughs> really quickly. And, and what we see is, is this, uh, which uh, we came across to this, um, let's say this notion of digital platforms and the inverted firm, and the inverted firm already exists. I mean, all, all the, let's say, again, Uber, Google, um, Alibaba, uh, Amazon, they work with this logic. They, they, they own little or nothing in production facilities, and they just connect the dots. And what they have in particular is that basically they inverted the firm completely where they have almost no staff relative to the size and profitability they have. They have a higher layer of seniors a higher level of managers and the, the, let's say, the vast amount of contracts that they control is their partners. Um, and this is particularly a, a sort of a replication of what happens in the, 19, in the 90s that we saw still three, four years ago, we thought that the reshoring movement was at the door because we had new ways of organizing uh, with, uh, through automation, let's say, in, 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 mm -hmm. in continents like Europe where we would re-attract the manufacturing back. But actually what we see is the opposite. 
well, not what we see, sorry, we don't see it yet. <laughs> it's likely to happen since the logic basically when, I, that's why I put the other one, I repeat that basically the same, is the same pyramid but now uh, with different colors. The top pyramid is, is basically where decision making um, is, is again, is, is sort of horizontal to the partners but, is, but, the, but the, the supporting uh, vertex is rather small within the vertically integrated company. And so what we see here is that, how much time do I have? Okay, what we see then here is that, um, and this is really concerning, is that we have already platforms uh, that perhaps will pervade how manufacturing is organized along the logic of what is, is known now for, for individual entrepreneurs, which is a mechanical torque, which is, is, is a facility provided by Amazon where there is a flat rate for any job that you want to subcontract and it can be done uh, for the benefits, for example, of Indians or Malaysians or let's say uh, service providers that are not in, in, in the vicinity where the uh, service is provided. And the flat rate is $5 for anything. So something similar, and, and this basically is a race to the, to the bottom in prices, which basically forces a strong, a strong competition that somehow comes to fit really well in what is the logic that we have seen over the last, over the last uh, let's say, two decades, where, let's say, the value added in activities of uh, service providing, uh, but also in manufacturing, where the profit margins are really, really, really squeezed, yeah, uh, where, the, let's say, the, the most profitable parts is in the after sales, which basically what the multi-sided companies do, uh, and in the part of creativity in R and D and post sales, and manufacturing, it it really resembles. I mean, the, this logic that we see here is the profit margins are so, are so uh, small that it, it is logic that companies will look to have for this kind of inverted uh, inverted logic of organization. Now, what this means is that. This is uh, somehow, a, a para, for me, uh, paradoxical eh? because we see, and it, it's been already predicted since, uh, uh, let's say, two, three years when this paper came to, came to life. And this is the effect expected in, in the, uh, let's say, distribution of jobs, uh, uh, jobs that will be available and those that will be squeezed. And what we see is, is that those, um, let's say, um, very specialized uh, jobs that have some kind of repetitive uh, task of processing information will be automatized. And what, we, what you have is, and the, the both, both extremes, yeah, really uh, sort of service oriented that cannot be replaced like plumbers, uh, nurses, yeah, that have more, let's say, on, hands on jobs those are the ones that will remain to some extent. And the other side is highly specialized, highly educated, highly creative, and highly paid. So what we see is both so far that the, indeed new technologies offer great solutions for socialization, but also for the environment, but also are in the verge of creating new social tensions that yet uh, we don't know how they, they will pan out. Yeah? and it's something that has to be addressed now. And I'll leave it there, thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. And uh, I think that we have only very few minutes because there is another session planned yeah. for 2.30. So if there is any question or comment from the audience, please, this is the time. I don't know if the other speakers want to comment on anything else or if you want to have a final comment to this, to close up. No, again, I guess in, in my case, it would be just to, to highlight that indeed, uh, let's say the, there will be, uh, there are very promising possibilities to actually uh, contribute to small development, development goals to, to let's say innovation in science and technology, but, uh, but at the same time, new tensions are being created that, that might go against the, the 
it's using in all the areas uh, of urban uh, like like good employment uh, uh, in sustainable communities that have access to jobs and, and these kinds of things. Thank you. The other hand, that links back to the very first point of the uh, interaction between societal change and technological change. We are also seeing discussions already around basic universal income, for example, that could be seen as a kind of reaction to this challenge or common space peer production where uh, people organize to solve, uh, to find solution to certain problems. So it's... Uh, the question how we change as societies in uh, along with these things, how this plays out. So we have to go back to this imagination uh, level with these yeah. things. Yeah. This is just projecting how things are going now, but it could go very different. Yeah. But, th but this is, this is a sort of diagnostic. I mean, you mentioned that the analysis is for the moment, yeah. uh, the prediction, and then the imagination. No? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what we see now is just basically describing what is going on now in the analytical part. No? But the imagination part is, is out of place. I, I, I just want to point out that, in my view, at least, <laughs> the replacement of jobs by technology is a continuum. It has always happened. I mean, if you go back in history, when the Industrial Revolution started, 36% of the European population works in the field producing food, right? And if you see the highlights in the newspapers at that time where like, we are all gonna die out of no food because everyone is going to like, uh, you know, hangar to work in a process line, a uh, production line, sorry. And didn't happen, so why? Because the Industrial Revolution brought us a solution. What 40 people were able to do in one day in the field was replaced by one guy in, 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 a, in a truck, right? Uh, what I believe is that uh, society will accommodate eventually faster than we expect. Uh, we are a really particular generation. We saw a world without the internet. We remember getting, having a doubt and keeping the doubt for us. Uh, we just saw the revolution in the last 27 years since the uh, internet, as we know, was created, the web, uh, web browser, etc. And what we're going to see now, probably it's going to be a lot of friction for us, but two generations or the next generation, the, the digital uh, people who were born in the last 30 years eventually, um, I will say they don't have the importance in their mind of big companies, well organized in this pyramid, uh, and they will prefer, you know, a more uh, disintegrated way of working based on, you know, you add a particular piece of value to this process, uh, and it's going to be all coordinated by this platform which is based on AI, right? Um, so bottom line, I believe uh, big companies, complex organized, et cetera, et cetera, um, are going to disappear. <laughs> and we are going to be all freelancers coordinated by this kind of platforms, adding value where we actually need to be adding it. I'm an optimistic. <laughs> I, I just want to add, uh, obviously, all these transformations are going to uh, generate winners and losers. Um, and I think that the bottom line will be to distribute the, the wealth into both sides. Uh, it gonna, it's going to be hard, but for example, a, a very clear example of the solutions I was talking about is for distributed generation. Um, the, the end user is going to win at the end of the day. However, uh, the infrastructure that's in place at this point for generation and transmission of electricity it's going to be uh, losing because they're going to be uh, the actual uh, utilities are going to be losing customers. They have infrastructure that hasn't been paid uh, in, in, the, in the time that it was supposed to be paid. Uh, so we need to find at least at this stage of transition solutions to, to uh, make this uh, transition more equitable to, to everyone. So, uh, so, so yeah, I think that's that's a good point to take in mind. Th th thank you very much. I think that this panel on uh, the impact of rapid technological change on SDGs has done justice to the to the topic, to the complexity involved in it, 
uh, presentations have been rich in content, full of insights. Um, I would like to just to mention that this was recorded. Um, we have a reporter, Berta Vallejo from Tilburg University, has a, a challenging task on wrap up this in a good report. Um, and all the contents of this will be part of the input that will be provided as well to the forum on science, technology, and innovation for the SDGs at the United Nations. I only have to end up this by thanking again the wonderful panelists that we had today and also uh, the audience. Uh, thanks uh, uh, again. It was a great pleasure for me to be here with you. All the best. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nakamura, uh, one of co-chairs, and uh, Fernando Sain is uh, another co-chair. Uh, this is a parallel session dedicated to a roadmap for SDR for SDGs. SDG is uh, basically a bottom-up uh, process. Uh, variety of uh, stakeholders, not only government, but also industry, academia, NPOs, citizens, they do their best uh, on, on their own wishes or wills. But uh, we, we may coordinate their activities uh, in a better way to uh, secure the uh, we that we reach the SDGs by 2030. Otherwise, no guarantee. We can make any guarantee to achieve uh, 2030 agendas. But uh, it's a very tough question. Uh, from an uh, industrial perspective, it's not new. Every, uh, every uh, company has 
their own roadmaps, uh, technological or, or sales or whatever. And also, uh, research institute has some technological roadmaps, but at national level or sub national levels, it's very challenging. It's quite a new agenda, and e also the international roadmaps much more uh, maybe uh, difficult. So anyway, uh, our wish is uh, to have some concrete uh, roadmaps uh, in this year or next year, so that we may have a better uh, foresight uh, for the achievement of the 2030. Uh, and the next year is in particular important because we will have a first a big uh, uh, milestone uh, in, in the next uh, September, uh, we have a general assembly and all the major uh, president or, or prime ministers gather and report on their uh, progresses. And so we'd like to have them to mention about the roadmaps, STI for SDG and the roadmaps, their roadmaps. So to do so, we have to be very well prepared. And fortunately, uh, this time we have uh, excellent uh, uh, panelists, uh, uh, specialists on roadmaps, and uh, they have uh, a number of uh, very exciting uh, practices. So uh, ask them to share their uh, practices and uh, challenges, and we have a discussion how to proceed in this uh, space. Thank you very much for, for your attendance. Um, from Innovation for Sustainable Development Network, we have also been, um, without knowing that uh, worldwide at the UN level, there is a process uh, interested in, in promoting science, technology, innovation roadmaps for the sustainable development goals. We also, we also have a, the task in our work program to, to, to use roadmaps or to analyze roadmaps on how they could be used for sustainability and in particular from a policy angle, because we know that uh, the early experiences in, in, in roadmaps, uh, the early experiences in roadmaps come from industry, uh, industry in, in Northern European countries, in the Netherlands, in particular uh, companies like Philips, they have a, a long, long tradition. In Japan, companies as well, they have used roadmaps for, for, for a long, long time. But in policy, in policy in the, in the 90s, there was an interest in, in foresight type of, uh, of tools that could give a sense of direction or where technological change could be actually uh, could be actually fostered and could be actually guided. In that context, is that we, as part of the as part of our work program, we we are um, University College London, one of our partners. He have been leading uh, um, a, a huge amount of work on on, on policies in general, uh, in particular policies that promote innovation for sustainability and for sustainability transformations. Is not only about guiding technical change or, te or guiding innovation, but how this actually transforms uh, the systems of mobility, of transport, of food, and, and how this in, in the end impact the, the quality of life of people and stops ecological degradation and for the climate uh, uh, events. So what we um, are doing, and it's a really modest approach also, that we, what we aim to, um, um, what we, what we aim to, to, to gain from this expert uh, group session is also to further contribute to, 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 to an ongoing process where we are, uh, where we have produced, uh, we are in the virtual producing a, a we have produced a, a, a policy document, which is brief, that tells something about, about, um, about this topic, and also uh, some, some basic guidelines on, 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 on um, on, on, on how to implement roadmaps. And just of a reflection, and, and this is something that, um, just not because it's something of the discussion today, uh, this is, this is uh, yeah, the, 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 policy, the policy outlook. This is uh, go, uh, going to be available at our website. But just to give you, to give you an idea what we have encountered in practice, 
in, in Europe, in most developed, most developed countries, roadmaps are actually well established because there is, uh, uh, um, there is lots of tradition in policy planning. But while working with, with developing countries, or in this case, small state islands, which have enormous pressure to fight climate change because basically they, they are, the vulnerability is really high, when developing a program for, for, for roadmaps, for policy roadmaps, and when you ask them, are you, are you concerned about the SDGs? Of course, but we are more concerned about action. We have a waste problem. We have, uh, you know, the reefs are being destroyed. And before entering into any process of started designing roadmaps, we encountered that capacity building in certain aspects, such as the strategic planning and stakeholder management was needed. So we couldn't even, we couldn't even start a process of road mapping without having some basic capacities, not because they were not present, but they were not in the, in the teams that were uh, supposed to lead a process of planning and a process of steering. So I'm just sharing this, this, um, this slide as an example of the many, many realities and the many senses of urgency that we are facing worldwide. We are, uh, in this session, we have fantastic examples uh, from, from uh, mostly from European and, and uh, uh, countries, from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, from Future Earth, uh, from, um, uh, from, uh, from Japan, of course, uh, that are paving the way and they are really uh, at the front, uh, the front run on, on explicitly linking policy uh, policy uh, uh, policy support to innovation with the implementation of the SDGs, and that's uh, that's from our perspective uh, a tremendous added value from this group of of, of of people and from these leading organizations that are um, actually interested in promoting change. So we would like to invite um, we would like to invite our first panelists. We will um, because of the restriction of the set of the room, we will need to ask each of our panelists to join us in the room. And after we are final, well, we'll have a, a break, we continue with the presentations, and then we will need to make an extra uh, break so they are, they, they, the support team can help us to reorganize the front of the room so we can have a semi, uh, semicircle uh, with a panel discussion and we, we make the session very interactive. Mm -hmm. So thank you, um, and Dr. Nakamura. Okay. So uh, let me ask uh, Ms. Utara Jungaman. Uh, manager of Sustainable Development Goals of WPCSD. It's a very fantastic uh, job. And uh, here we have some copies. Uh, thank you very much. So you are in, if you are interested, you can take them. Also, they're available on the website.
If you have any more questions, please uh, ask her at the second part of the panel. So uh, we would like to move on to the next uh, uh, theme-specific roadmaps. And the first uh, uh, panelist is uh, uh, Mr. Eric Phil of Swedish Hub of uh, Futures. Please come on here on the Exponential Climate Action Roadmap. Good to use the microphone because the session is being recorded. Ah, no, that's Just from that point of view. Just close enough. There we go. Super. Yeah, there we go. Haha. -ha. Good. No, uh, it's not live stream. Just record it. Just record it. Okay. Um, can you hear me? I'm not quite. I think it needs to be pretty close. This. I like standing up. I'm gonna do this. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll turn this off. This is, this is on, good, thank you. Um, okay, so you can go to the first slide. Um, I was gonna say next when I need to change. Um, no, so go back. <laughs> um, so um, I'll be presenting the, the uh, Exponential Climate Action Roadmap, um, which is on the SDG 7 and, and 13 on clean energy and uh, climate change. The Global Climate Action Summit uh, that was in September was the largest summit for, for non-state actors since COP21. Um, and we worked with them to produce a roadmap that can kind of set the stage for a new kind of discussion. It was presented by Christina Figueras from Mission 2020, uh, former UNFCCC uh, chief, uh, and Jan Rockstrom from, from PIC Potsdam in, in the, um, the beginning of the event next. Um, and the, the roadmap starts from the understanding that we need a very rapid transformation of the, um, the uh, our entire economy um, and very rapid mitigation um, in order to, to reach the targets for one and a half or two degrees Celsius. And we're starting kind of from the understanding the decadal, the, uh, decadal pathway of the um, carbon law. Uh, there was a paper produced uh, that came out in science in 2017. Um, and uh, that kind of understanding that we need to halve emissions uh, starting 2020 and then halve emissions every decade. Um, and this has later been verified uh, by the IPCC one and a half degree special report that came out also in September, where uh, one of the uh, scenarios that they assess uh, goes comes very close to, to this pathway. So we're kind of very much in line with the science. Um, next, and we're focusing on the period up to 2030. So we're dividing the, um, the emissions up into sectors. Um, so we're doing kind of sectoral roadmaps and, and looking at kind of how we do a halving for each sector. And uh, looking at the, the, the key um, solutions for each sector, maybe three or eight kind of sets of solutions that, that we think are the most important. Um, for instance, in, in transport and buildings, etc., uh, on the global level. Next. So looking at a, a sector, what we do is, uh, so this is a backcasting exercise, where we look at where we need to be. Um, and then we look at you know, wha wha you know, wha how do solutions need to scale up? Uh, we're not saying it's gonna be easy, but how do they need to scale up in order to, um, to, in order to accommodate this? Um, this is where we need to go. And uh, in order to kind of verify the solutions, we, we have proof points there. You can see them to the, to the right. And the proof points show you know, where this has been done in reality. So it's always kind of something that's based on, on uh, a company or a city or a, a country that has done something in reality. And you can see if this is scaled up, then you can see this solution becoming reality. Um, next. Um, we're also basing it on the understanding of the need for, for very you know, rapid change and driven by uh, exponential change, exponential technologies. And we think there is, is a great, um, 
that there's a bit lack of understanding of these kind of trajectories. Uh, we see international organizations li like International Energy Agency has repeatedly failed in, in projecting with what kind of growth we can see, for instance, in, in renewable energies, etc. So this, this graph is for for the growth in, in solar energy. And if you're following exponential change, you know, and you know something's growing 40% per year, you know it's, it's gonna be pretty high in the future. Um, next. Um, so we're kind of applying that thinking to the roadmap. Uh, and we can see that w with the current growth, if we only you know, project the current growth of solar and wind power into the future, I mean these technologies will be completely dominating in the energy system well before 2030. Um, for the roadmap for, for the backcasting we're doing, uh, we, we can see that even if we can only achieve half of the current growth in the future, um, these technologies would uh, be able to do about reach about 50% uh, of the, the electricity production. Um, so th there is enormous potential in this, and it also it's also true for, for other technologies, batteries, technologies, and even kind of social change and behavior change can follow these kind of trajectories, starting with, with sm few people and, s and small movements, but they've been running for a long while, and suddenly they can, they can take off seemingly unexpectedly. Uh, next. Um, but we don't think that this is something that's going to happen by itself. So for, for each sector that we go through, um, we are showing what kind of, of cli climate leadership that we call it. Uh, that's you know individuals and companies taking leadership that's required. And we also show what kind of, of policy, what kind of radical policies and sets of, of policies that's needed in order to, to drive this home. Uh, so kind of approaching this from, from different sides. Next. Um, we also, I mean, we, we, we produced this paper print, which kind of sets out a, a vision and, and kind of scales the issue. But we think in order for this to actually happen, for people to implement it, we need something that, that you can work with, that people can see, that you can interact with. Uh, you can see the whole scale of the challenge. You can see a, a full mapping. Uh, you and you can, you can kind of follow things from, from these strategies through solutions all the way down to kind of actions and, and follow up. Um, so we're, we're b having this interactive um, framework pathway set, set up um, and, and we're using the same kind of agile based tool that Swedish government is working with, uh, with a couple of agencies and initiative to map up Swedish emissions uh, in something called the Swedish Climate Dashboard. Um, and we'll be applying that then f for, um, for the globe. Um, so that is kind of ongoing work uh, and it hasn't been published yet. Um, but to, to kind of round off, we think that um, exponential and, and uh, digital technologies um, are kind of a game changer, the wild card in, in uh, transformations. But the problem is that there's kind of no compass direction for that business. So it's going out uh, disrupting things, moving fast, disrupting things. But it doesn't really know, kind of it doesn't have a direction of where to go. So we're trying to put it on the direction of you have to solve climate crisis. Like you cannot operate in a you know, four or five degree planet. You need to be part of solving the issues. Next. Um, so up front, the Global Climate Action Summit, we set up the Step Up Declaration um, where companies, uh, pretty influential companies, signed up that they would work really hard to implement this in their organizations and not just I kind of in their, in their supply and their, their direct effect, but also the indirect effect they have through their services, their products, and uh, through their influence on, on society and policy makers, etc. So we're we kind of using this to drive this forward. Uh, these are the partners that have been involved. Um, and you can find the uh, web link there to the exponential roadmap. And I don't know if I have time for questions now or if we're taking them later. changes, uh, uh, behavioral changes, mm -hmm. uh, regulation, whatever. So you have uh, not only a scientist, but also uh, social science, social scientists, economists, and others in a uh, group for discussion? Mm -hmm. um, we have been involving uh, those with a, with, a, with a social science background, particularly people kind of working on transformations. We've been working with some of the best who do 
kind of transformational research and understand kind of you know what do we need to do to tr transform societies and uh, we set up several workshops around this uh, as well so we're trying to get this from different angles um, I think this is something we'll be looking more into the econo the, the, the economics and the the social sciences need to be even further um, addressed um, in future work but I think we we need to go deeper in many many areas um, going forward with this okay I think this is a really good question. Uh, I think we're really just in kind of starting up this. Um, we've had a long conversation with some of these companies, uh, but I think it's it's too early to kind of say what the effect has been. I mean, th this is something we launched only in, in September. So I'm, I'm sorry, we, we can't really see the, the effects uh, yet. I think first of all, uh, I mean the we we, we have done uh, some modeling there, uh, but I think this is this is a you know a, a kind of a least viable product uh, where it's 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 um, kind of more f framing the challenge. So what we want to do is to do this much much deeper, uh, much more in details. Just just saying that. Um, then I think on on the on the policy side, um, I think one of the things we've been discussing discussing is kind of having an exponential policy thought to it, where it's, it's really about kind of scaling up policies that actually work. And I think that's, that's part of the, of, of the interactive map we're doing, is that you could, um, you know, if, if you're working on a certain issue, um, you can see kind of what policies are, are suggested, you know, based on what's worked somewhere else. Um, and then you can try to implement those policies. Um, so it, I think the it's, it's a lot about kind of you know, doing what's already been done well uh, in, in different places. And it's also about, um, I think, the policies that, that drive these kind of exponential changes is more, it's a lot about kind of understanding the system, the systemic changes that will happen. Because um, it's, it's not just, you know, changing one device for another. It, it's, it's, it is a systemic change. And sometimes that requires, uh, you know, a change in infrastructure, uh, allowing new business models, etc. So it's very much a, a, a policy, policy needs to move pretty rapidly and be able to accommodate the disruption that is needed and also accommodate the social uh, impacts of that disruption. So when, when a coal plant is about to be shut down uh, or a, co you know, a, a mine or something, then there has to be policies uh, as, as they just did, did in, in Spain when they're closing many other mines now, when they have policies uh, they come in and, and, and protect the workers there uh, so that they, they don't all become unemployed overnight. Um, so it, I think it's, it's a lot about having a, a policy that, that, that allows those kind of transformations in, the, in, uh, in a smooth way. Okay, uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you, you have been tackling very, very important but difficult uh, challenges. Uh, so let me uh, move on to the next uh, panelist. Uh, uh, Mr. Marine Strand, uh, fossil fleet spirit. <laughs> Do I pronounce correctly? Thank you. <laughs> uh, fossil free Sweden. Uh, but I think uh, in this program it was the Swedish name, Fossil Fritt Sverige. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me here. 
uh, letting me share our thoughts about uh, the roadmaps that uh, we have been doing in Sweden. Um, as Eric was doing, uh, I'm also narrowing down to the SDG 13 climate action. Uh, but first of all, uh, Fossil Free Sweden, um, it's a government initiative uh, and the aim is to accelerate action to reach the Swedish target, which is um, net zero emissions in 2045, so five years before the, climate, uh, the Paris Agreement uh, year. Uh, one of the things that we are doing are these uh, roadmaps for uh, fossil-free competitiveness uh, that we initiated about one year ago. Um, it's, uh, the aim is to let the, the sectors themselves uh, tell their story about how to become fossil-free with uh, increased competitiveness. Um, and it's really a bottom-up process it's uh, kind of inspired but by the Paris Agreement method where they left out the burden sharing but focusing on opportunities and uh, how to get things better uh, and at the same time reaching this target. Um, so we offer these uh, sectors a framework. Um, we uh, our framework that we had, uh, we have two uh, statements, they had to be uh, fossil free in 2045 uh, and increase competitiveness. And if they did this roadmap, we promised them to have an event uh, with the Swedish Prime Minister where they could leave their, uh, their reports to him, um, which we managed in the end. But he was uh, sick that day, so we had the Innovation uh, Minister and the Climate Minister instead. Um, anyway, I always get the question, so how, how did you have to convince them about uh, the 2045 target? And the answer is no. We the 2045 was never a discussion. Uh, the target was set by the government and the parliament, and there was never a discussion about uh, negotiating about uh, this year. Um, second uh, bullet here, then, uh, competitiveness. Uh, I think it's clear that a mind shift has happened. Uh, all this sector that we work with really see this as an issue of competitiveness. Uh, they see that all markets and all countries are uh, changing. And it's a trans transformation where all countries, all markets will uh, start to uh, demand green products and services. And if they want to survive this transformation, they have to change. So competitiveness was really the, the, the driving force for these nine sectors that we work with uh, during this winter. Um, uh, the nine sectors were very heavy industries, actually. Uh, we started with the steel industry, and we thought if we get the steel industry to tell their, their fossil-free <laughs> story, it will be easier to get the other sectors as well. So we, uh, with these nine sectors that we work with, uh, we managed to, uh, to target 32% of the Swedish uh, missions. Um, and um, the, this uh, kind of roadmap that we uh, offered them to do consists of exactly the same three parts as was presented by the first speaker. So it was the current uh, state the opportunities of changing and changing markets, how they forecast their market and call to action, uh, divided in two parts. What the sector itself is going to do and what they wish for the policies to do. Uh, so um, it's kind of a contract between these sectors and the government. Uh, and during these six, eight months, uh, when these sectors work with the roadmap, there was uh, an election coming up in Sweden, and we knew that there were not going to be uh, a majority uh, government. So we, during this process, we've talked to all political parties to really have a dialogue about these uh, policies, and some of them we tweaked a bit to get more, more parties to like them. Um, and um, I'm really optimistic that uh, when we have a government in Sweden, uh, 
many of these uh, suggested policies will be implemented. Um, but in this process, um, these uh, sectors really expressed how happy they are to finally can say yes to something when they before didn't really like the climate policy coming up and they have to say no to everything. Now they have the chance to tell their story and be positive and uh, suggest things uh, without being interrupted. Um, and third bullet here, uh, the stage where we are now, we uh, the government um, got these uh, roadmaps in April uh, and we are now working with uh, more sectors. Uh, but this for these nine sectors, the real work starts now. Um, a lot has happened during this process. They really gathered and then learned to understand uh, their customers and their the whole sector. Uh, and they have managed to start new corporations and a lot has happened that you can't see in the text. Uh, but this is a start and a lot will happen afterwards um, when they implement their uh, roadmaps. Um just to mention something about the content, uh, these uh, nine sectors was, was steel, cement, um, building sector, aviation, uh, heavy trucks, uh, forest sector, um, and some other sectors. And we are now doing some kind of analysis to understand common uh, challenges for all these sectors. And among this is the, the demand for biomass almost all sectors need a lot of biomass to manage. <laughs> uh, we are lucky to have a lot of forest in Sweden, uh, but the forest will be used for biofuels, for bioplastics, for textile, for um, a lot of things, for batteries and for uh, new materials. Uh, and um, uh, when all these sectors need a biomass, uh, we have to analyze how to best use it. Um, the second analysis that goes through all uh, sectors is big investments and uh, technology leaps. Um, and we are uh, starting, or trying to start at least, uh, a roadmap for the financial sector to, uh, to target this. Um, and the third um, common challenge is new business models, of course. And uh, we can't solve it for them, they have to do it themselves, of course, but uh, they have started new corporations and uh, uh, we think we are optimistic about it. Um, yes, that was all I had to say about this. Thank you so much. It's very <laughs> impressive that you, you keep a contact uh, very patiently with the government and also the yeah. industrial sectors. Uh, I just confirm. You say that the government, Swedish government, is uh, going to implement some kind of roadmaps? Uh, Can you elaborate that? Yes, we have had dialogue with all political parties yes. uh, on how they like these political suggestions that came up in the roadmaps. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, most of them, all political parties like, because almost all political parties uh, are part of the agreement of the 2045 target. So they do have to have a policy to implement it or to, to reach the target anyway. Uh, and we also have had uh, much uh, dialogues with the uh, ministries as well. Here you're looking at SDG 13, uh, and I guess also SDG um, 7, 
probably is is mapped into that. But um, you know, if you looked across the SDGs, are you going to have similar kind of? You know, you've solved your intersectoral problem mm. within the context of SDG 13. Mm. If you look across the SDGs, are you going to come up with similar inconsistencies or trade-offs that uh, haven't yet been identified? Uh, yes, it's an interesting question. Um, the initiative Fossil Free Sweden, where I work, we mainly focus on the climate issue. Um, but of course, we can also come into the SDG about the renewable energy. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting um, question. Um, I think absolutely that will be possible. But as the other Swede in the panel this morning was talking about, it's, an, it's a real challenge with our ministries. Uh, we have to like uh, make them cooperate in another way to uh, implement all SDGs uh, in this r this way. Uh, Michal Nijinsky, sorry, I just happened to have a microphone anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> my th this is, is a really interesting example and, 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 a, and, a, and a, an example that is still very much alive. And I, w I wonder, and it's a Swedish example, but I wonder to what extent an international dimension of, of the you know, sectoral problems was brought in by, by business and whether you're envisaging some sort of um, continuation that would engage yeah. partners along supply chains, value chains that, uh, yeah. that might be necessary to... to, to yeah to reach the visions that the sectors have done yeah. together during this exercise? Um, I would say it differs a lot between the sectors. For example, the steel industry, their market is mainly outside Sweden, uh, but their production is in Sweden. Um, their solutions uh, would definitely be, be uh, able to implement in other parts of the world. Uh, they are, for example, uh, need uh, hydrogen instead, instead of coal or uh, biochar. Um, so the technique will definitely be able to, to be implemented. Um, the policy, on the other hand, is harder, I think. Um, not all countries work the same way, and I think this is like really um, th the Swedish way. We, we have coached them through the policy development process. And um, even though it might be, uh, as, as in a sense, uh, policy innovation, we told them not to innovate. <laughs> uh, because it's always easier to implement a policy if it's been used in another sector or in another way in Sweden so that the politicians feel familiar with the policy set up already. Yes, and uh, other sectors, for example, forest sector, and um, yeah, there are some sectors that are really Swedish um, um <laughs> specific, I would say. Did it, uh, did it answer your question? <laughs> As a good example from this exercise, I, I was able to model and introduce me to the uh, construction sector uh, people, uh, responsibles, and uh, they indicated that both in the analysis they included imported uh, wares. So anything that they're using to build that's imported was covered by their roadmap, um, and that's going to require them in the implementation phase, I guess, to deal with their suppliers outside of the country. Uh, they haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, and also they uh, have been taking the roadmap to their uh, foreign subsidiaries and saying, this this is coming, you're going to have to do this too. Uh, so the, the main company in charge of it, sorry, they have been doing that. So. Thank you very much. We have, um, we have um, according to the agenda, we have a, a break uh, for uh, coffee. Um, although it says the half an hour, I would suggest that we um, do 20 minutes. So we, can, uh, we, have, a, we have a few other presentations. Uh, we have a, a panel discussion ahead of us. And so if you want to come back here in 20 minutes sharp, we will be continuing with the with the with the with the rest of the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank, Thank you. you.